Amen. Just to follow up, that's a good verse for this morning's sermon, too. If you look down at verse number 17, where Paul says, Yea, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. Look how many times he uses this word here. He's talking about <laughs> being killed. And he says, you know, joy, right? He said, I joy, I rejoice with you all. For the same cause do also ye joy, rejoice with me. You know, because he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? So that's a good uh, follow up on that um, the sermon this morning, and then uh, Brother Luke, I was kicking myself, like, you know, why I didn't bring up um, that David said after his sin, and after his son died, and after he was judged there, um, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You know, that's such a great verse there, because it shows that what did David do when he fell into sin? He, he fell into sin, he got out of God's commandment, out of the law of God, which um, Proverbs was telling us about there. He lost his joy. He didn't lose his salvation. It's a great um, eternal security verse as well, but he lost the joy of his salvation. So we're going to be looking at something completely different. I just wanted to follow up on that um, from this morning. But look at Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2, and look down at verse number 10. Philippians chapter number 2, and look at verse number 10. The Bible says that, well, actually, go to verse number 9. So it's talking about Jesus here. Because he died on the cross and he did this, he was obedient unto death. He lived a sinless life. Remember, it just wasn't the death on the cross. It was the sinless life that Jesus lived up to that point. He was humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Look at verse number 9. It says, Wherefore, God hath, because of this, God hath also high, hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So Jesus isn't just some other way. He is the name. There's only one way. That's why you're out soul winning and you talk to people and they're like, well, faith in God. Well, no. What is God's name? Because unless you are talking about Jesus, you know, that is something different. So it is Jesus. It is a name above every name. And verse number 10 is going to be the point of the sermon this evening. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth, things under the earth. The title of the sermon is Every Knee. Every Knee. Look at verse number 10 again. It says that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven. So things here is talking about souls. It's talking about people in this case. You know, talking about the souls that are in heaven will bow a knee to Jesus. Of course, that's an easy one to see right there. They're saved. They've already trusted in Jesus. Of course, they will bow the knee to Jesus. But then look what it says. It says, and things in earth. Now it gets a little confusing because you're like, well, not everybody on the earth even, you know, believes in Jesus or even knows who Jesus is for that matter. matter. And then, it, and this is interesting, and, and Jacob even just pointed this out to me as we were reading the verse. He said, and things under the earth. That's really interesting. So the Bible here is saying that every knee will bow. Every person will bow to Jesus at some point. Every knee. Things under the earth. The people that are on the earth that have never heard of Jesus. And if they die in that state, they will be in hell. The things under the earth, the people in hell will bow to Jesus. And it gets even better. It says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You say, what in the world? When will this happen? We'll turn to Revelation chapter number 20, and let's just go through this real quick. Let's do a real Bible study about this, and then we'll apply it uh, this evening. But when will this happen? I mean, how is this even possible that people in hell, they're literally in hell because they did not believe on Jesus, and they're going to bow a knee to Jesus, not only are they going to bow, bow a knee, but they're going to confess him. They're going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. So what do we've got? Let's remember our end times uh, events here. We've got the rapture. You know, we've got all the things leading up to the rapture with the Antichrist and all the stuff that we've preached through. But then we've got, you know, the rapture, which would be the first resurrection. All right, that's the first resurrection. And after that, you know, we've got the wrath of God for that last three and a half years. And then after that wrath of God, we go right into the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Okay. After the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that's where Revelation chapter number 20 picks up. If you look down at verse number 11, the Bible says this, and it says, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face and the, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. So now the dead, now we're talking about the people that are literally being taken out of hell. 
You know, this is the dead. This is that second death. And another book, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So now we've got basically two books that are open here, right? We've got the book of life, and I, preach, I should probably preach another sermon on that. I haven't done that in several years. But basically, everybody that is in heaven is in the book of life, but everybody starts in the book of life. That's how the book of life works in the Bible. People are only removed from the book of life. So everybody starts there, which makes perfect sense. As I was, you know, I was alive once, you know, um, without the law, right? Somebody said that about um, that one of the babies smiled or something, and somebody said that today, like, oh, she's alive without the law. You know, she's happy about that. I don't know if they were just joking, but the point is, children, small children, babies are alive without the law. Amen. All right, so you've got the dead, small and great before God, and the books were open. So one is the book of life, and it's showing all the people who are saved, all right? The people who haven't been blotted out. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book. So these two books, one book is this book right here, and the other book is the book of life. So you've got the book of life, and you've got the Bible and the people, those things that were written in the books according to their works. One is the book of life, because if you're in the book of life, you're not judged by your works. That's how that goes. But if you're not in the book of life, you get what you always wanted, you're judged by your works. Okay? And you're all going to come up, all those people that are judged by their works are going to be found to be, as Romans 4 says, in debt. They're going to found to have, if they're going to be all found to have debt. The only question is, how much debt are they going to have? All right? And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So imagine, imagine you die, you know, somebody dies unsaved tomorrow. Somebody dies unsaved in 2024 America, and then in 100 years the rapture happens. And so we got 100 years on top of, you know, 2024 America, the rapture happens, and then we've got that three and a half years, we go into a thousand year reign of Christ, and then after the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, you're brought out of hell. Death and hell are opened up, and you are brought out of hell, and you are set in front of Jesus. And you've been in hell for 1103.5 years at that point. Every knee will bow. Those people at that point will be begging Jesus Christ, confessing him as Lord. They will be begging him for a second chance. Right. But what they are going to be is they are going to be judged according to their works, and then the whole lot of them are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. All right, so there is no second chances after that. Now, I found something interesting, and I had known about this, so I put some. I put some, uh, a little study together for you um, this evening. So basically, after somebody dies that they're not saved, immediately they, they will lift up their eyes immediately in hell. But God does something interesting for us, and I'm going to show you a proof of it from the Bible. But let me just show you some final quotes of some just self-avowed atheists, self-avowed people that just rejected God, rejected the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. God does something interesting for us here. He gives us a witness. He gives us a witness. I've heard, I've heard old pastors say that they've seen this, and I believe that I've seen it one time in my life, where you can, you can see whether or not someone is saved in that, by, that, by the, rea the reaction that they have, the peace that they have, or the, the lack of peace that they have in the moments before they die. And I've heard this from more than one pastor, and I have seen it once myself. Let me give you a couple examples. Thomas Hobbes, a famous, he died in 1679. He was a famous, famous uh, English philosopher, scientist, historian. I don't know if you've heard of him. His last words, famous, you know, uh, famously against God, against Christianity. I say again, quote, I say again, if I had the whole world at my disposal, I would give it to live one day. I am about to take a leap into the dark. Final words. Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine is a famous, uh, you know, American Revolution figure. He wrote Common Sense. 
um, and some other writings. He was, a, he was a pure enlightenment thinker. And he was famously anti-God. You know, he had, if, you read his, if you read his writings, you know, he's got logic and, you know, philosophical enlightenment logic, but he was completely anti-Christianity. Uh, but he said this, he's a, Thomas Paine was a leading atheistic writer in the American colonies. His last quote before he died was, Stay with me for God's sake, I cannot bear to be left alone. O oh Lord, help me. O oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? I would give worlds if I had them that the age of reason had never been published. One of his, one of his famously anti-God enlightenment works. O oh Lord, help me. Christ, help me. No, don't leave. Stay with me. Send even a child to stay with me, for I am on the edge of hell here alone. If ever the devil had an agent, I have been that one. His own words. Sir Thomas Scott, maybe you haven't heard of him, but he was a chancellor of England. He died in 1594. He said this, final words, Until this moment I thought there was neither God, neither a God nor a hell. Now I know and feel that there are both. And I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. Isn't that something, this witness that God gives us? Why? I mean, who are these people speaking to? They're not speaking. You say, why does God do this? And God did it in the Bible. And I'm going to show you where God did it in the Bible. But you say, why did God do this? It's like, why not use this unsaved person to at least be a witness to people that are around that are witnessing this? Voltaire. Voltaire, famous anti-Christian atheist, died in 1778. He's a writer. He's a famous philosopher. I'm abandoned by God and man. He said to his physician, I will give you half of what I am worth if you will give me six months of life. And he was told that that's obviously impossible to just save someone. It's, you know, they just can't save you. We're all going to die. Then he said, quote, then I shall die and go to hell. His nurse said, for all the money in Europe, I would not want to see another unbeliever die. All night long, he cried for forgiveness. And look, whether or not that had anything, you know, whether or not there was a chance there, I, I don't know in that case, probably, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of these people were probably, it was probably too late for them at that point. Robert Ingersoll, 1833, an American writer, an order of the golden age of free thought. His last words, O oh God, if there be a God, save my soul, if I have a soul. Or some say, see, that's not really a, a trusting statement <laughs> right there. O oh God, if there be a God, save my soul, if I have a soul, from hell, if there be a hell. You know, that's not really a, a trusting statement. David Hume, atheist philosopher from Scotland, died in 1711. He cried loud on his deathbed, I am in flames on his deathbed. It is said that his desperation was a horrible scene. 1821, the death of Napoleon Bonaparte. French emperor or dictator, I guess you could say. Probably responsible for the death of millions of people. Brought war to Europe. I die, quote, I die before my time and my body will be given back to the earth. Such is the fate of him who has been called the great Napoleon. What an abyss between my deep misery and the eternal kingdom of Christ. Charles IX, 1574, a French king. This guy was famous for, you know, slaughtering the Huguenots. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. But basically, he urged by his mother, he gave the order for the massacre of the French Huguenots, a famous story in which 15,000 people were slaughtered in Paris alone and 100,000 others in sections of France for no other reason than they professed Christ. He finally died bathing in blood bursting from his veins, and to his physicians, he said in his last hours, asleep or awake, I see the mangled forms of the Huguenots passing before me. They drop with blood. They point their open wounds. Oh, that I had spared at least the little infants in the bosom. What blood? I know not where I am. How will all this end? What shall I do? I am lost forever. Oh, I have done wrong. Joseph Stalin. 
died in 1953, the premier of the USSR, responsible for the deaths of, I believe, probably close to 100 million people. Says, my father died a difficult, she told, in, in a Newsweek interview with Svetlana, his daughter, she told of his death. This is Joseph Stalin's daughter. She said, my father died a difficult and terrible death. God grants an easy death only to the just. At what seemed to be the very last moment, he suddenly opened his eyes and cast a glance over everyone in the room. It was a terrible glance, insane or perhaps angry. His left hand was raised as though we were, he were pointing to something above and bringing down a curse on us all. The gesture was full of menace, and the next morning he was dead. That guy's at the bottom level of hell. Amen. 1997, Anton LeVay dies, author of the Satanic Bible. I remember this guy from throughout my childhood, how wicked this man was, the Church of Satan and all the things that he would put out. His dying words, listen to this. Oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. Because even the dark rider throws his own people from the horse. Satan destroys even his own. And that's where he realized that. Turn to Psalm chapter number 14. Actually, I'm going to read that. You turn to Acts chapter 17, or Acts chapter 7. God gives us the other side of this. God gives us an example in the Bible of a witness of the other side of this, of somebody who is before a saved person, who were before they are about to die, he gives a witness to the people around them. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But look at Acts chapter 7, and look at verse number 55. We're looking at the death of of Stephen, the first recorded martyr in the Bible here, in the book of Acts. It says in Acts chapter 7, I mean, he's not the first martyr, but I mean, he's the first one in the book of Acts. It says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, of course, God promises us that if we're in a time where we're being killed, we're being persecuted, and we're literally being put under duress, that he will give us, the, the Holy Ghost will give us the words to say. And I believe that's what you see in this great sermon that... that uh, Stephen preaches in Acts chapter number 7. But here we see he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He is able before he even dies to witness Jesus Christ standing there on the right hand of God. And he sees that and he said, behold, I see. He says this to everybody. He says, behold, now just contrast this statement with the statements I just read you. He says, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then, of course, they're like, we can't have him saying this stuff anymore. They cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul, who became the apostle Paul. So look, we see that witness working both ways. But there's, so, there's many more examples of people that professed, you know, just hatred of God, hatred of Jesus Christ, and their last words and their last demeanor before they die. But you look at Stephen, and God gives him moments before his death this beautiful picture of Jesus Christ standing there, and he tells everybody what he sees. It's really a beautiful scene in the Bible. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. But you see here that every knee will definitely, it's not, hard to, it's not hard to figure out how every knee will bow. When people have spent 100 years, 1,000 years, I mean, look, five minutes in hell, 30 seconds in hell, I mean, two seconds in hell. Even before these people died, you think about it, even before these people died, these reprobates that hated God, that preached against him, turn people against the Lord. All these, I mean, basically false prophets is what we were looking at there. All these false prophets who had been given up by God, God showed them so they could voice what they were seeing and what they were experiencing before they died. Look, those people were begging for mercy before they even got to hell. So it is definitely not hard to see that if somebody has spent five seconds in hell, their knee will bow. 
They will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. A couple of those guys did right there before they even died, before they even left this earth. It's great proof that it can be too late for you while you're still alive as well. It's great proof of that. But look, at the great white throne, every single knee will bow. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. So what's the point of this? What's the point of this? What can we take from this doctrine that every knee will bow? Why does God even tell us this? Why does God tell us that every knee will bow? And I'm just going to give you one point tonight, one, one reason that God tells us this and gives us this. Look, it's a comfort to us. It's a comfort to us. It, it's God talks about vengeance is mine. It's not yours. You know, I'm going to take care of everything. There's going to be a time when every single one of these people, they know the truth, but it's going to be too late for them. All right, look at Hebrews chapter number 11. So the point that I want to make is this. The point that I want to make, and the reason God tells us that every knee will eventually bow, look, we're not going to see that in our lifetimes on this earth. We will see it in eternity, but we are not going to see every knee bowing in this Christian life, in this physical body that we are living. All right? Look at Hebrews chapter number 11. Look at verse number 36. But look, this is a promise that just will be fulfilled in eternity for us. It will be fulfilled in our glorified bodies in everlasting life. Look at verse number 36. And this is nothing new. Every promise in the Bible is not fulfilled in your physical life on this earth. Look at verse number 36. It said, and others. This is just talking about Christians. It's called the faith chapter. It goes through great Christians throughout history. It just talks about how some people did great things. Some people did, you know, all these wonderful things in their life. You know, Samson and Sarah and, you know, all these different um, prophets and, and men of God. But then others, look at verse 36. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. It's saying, like, other, there's other people. There's other Christians where their life was just cruel mockings, scourgings, imprisonment. I mean, you could kind of look at Paul and say that was kind of his life. He didn't have this great earthly life. He was in prison. He was in trouble. He was being beaten. He was being shipwrecked, he said. They were stoned, Stephen. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. That's, I believe, Isaiah is what uh, most historians think. He was sawn in half. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. Remember James? He was killed by Herod with the sword. John, uh, John and James, James and John, the brother of John, not Jesus' brother. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. So the Bible is saying that like, there's some Christians that this, is their, this was their life. This wasn't their end, but this was their whole life. And the Bible is saying that even though this was their whole life, I mean, why were all the, why were all the disciples killed? What were they doing? I mean, all the disciples were killed, one by, I mean, except for John, they were all martyred in one way or another, in horrible, horrible ways. For what? Not for being on vacation in Africa. They were martyred because they were out in different parts of the world, in Asia, in Greece, all these different places, and they were doing what? Africa, they were preaching the gospel. So the Bible is saying these people were treated terribly, and the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts, mountains, dens and caves of the earth. They're hiding from people. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So the Bible is showing us here that like, we're just not going to receive every single promise in the Bible in our physical life. Like our eternal life, you know, that's sealed. We know we're going to have that. We can have that hope of eternal life, the Bible says. But what that's trying to say here is that we don't win here, is what the Bible is telling us. And it's trying to give us some comfort that, hey, we don't win here, in this body, on this earth. Just like these people didn't, they didn't win here. They didn't win here, but every knee will bow. It's not... But, but that's not a promise that we are going to see in this physical lifetime. It's hope that we have for the future. It's a promise for the future. You know, sometimes I just think that we need 
that reminder. I think we need that reminder that, you know, we eventually win, but we don't win here. We don't win here. I mean, months ago, months ago, I, I don't know, maybe 10 months ago, I read a book that was one of the best books I have read in a very long time. I'm not going to tell you the name. If you want the name of the book, I'll tell you after the service, because it's not really a book that I would, I would recommend a church to read. It was a book on, it was a modern, real-life story. It was a modern, real-life story about, yeah, there was a lot of war talk, a lot of real um, talk about men in war. But it was, a, it was an American story. It was a story that happened in the last 10 years. But it was about, uh, you know, about a bunch of tough men in a terrible, that found themselves in a terrible situation. I mean, seemingly impossible. They, these, these men were in this, this group, and they, they, had, they got in a terrible situation where the leader of their group was just doing terrible things, was just this toxic, horrible, um, you know, leader. And they were in a position where their lives were in danger. They're, I mean, they're like, what do we do? Like, what do we do here? Their lives were in danger. If they would do something about it, their dreams and careers would be over if they did something about it. And look, ultimately, a minority stood up in this group and did the right thing. And it's interesting because one of the reasons that, you know, a couple of these men gave was, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I have to go home and I have to look my, my kids in the eye. I have to go home and I have to be able to look at my wife face to face for the rest of my life, even though this will cost me my career, this will cost me my dreams, this could cost me my life. So they stood up, this minority stood up, they did the right thing, and guess what? They lost. They lost. In the public's eye, they were the, they lost. They lost in, they lost in court, they lost in the public's eye, the, you know, the, the person that, that was causing the trouble and trying to, you know, um, to destroy them basically did. But the point is this, they had to go home and look their kids in the eyes. And they had to go home and look, they did the right thing. And they, it was just, but we have to recognize that as Christians. It's not about winning here. It's not about winning here. And aside from this, this secular story, aside from this secular story, you know, what we have to recognize as Christians, look, there's another, there's another analogy that I'll give you. In the story of the Battle of Gettysburg, the story of the Battle of Gettysburg is a three-day battle. And the very first the very first engagement of that battle on the first day, a Union uh, cavalry officer named General, General John Buford got to the town, the area first. He was able to kind of pick out like, the best spot to fight from. And he knew, and it's, it's quoted in the book, it's kind of, I don't know if this is the exact quote, but it's quoted in the book, The Killer Angels, where he sees this ground. He's just got a few men, and he knows that the Confederate Army is coming. He knows he's got to fight to keep the high ground. And he's like, if we don't keep the high ground, there will be the devil to pay, is what he said. Because he knew that if they didn't fight from that position, that when the rest of the Union Army came, that they would be at a disadvantage, and they would, it would be a horrible massacre. So he knew the lives that they had to sacrifice themselves would save thousands of lives in the coming days, in the coming battles. So he had to secure that high ground. But the problem with us as Christians is we don't get to choose the hill to fight on. Wherever the truth is, that's where we fight. Amen. Wherever the truth is, that's where we stand. On, and on this earth, on this earth, we are not guaranteed the high ground. We are not guaranteed to be able to win this battle. But guess what, folks? We have to remember this, that it's not about winning here. And that's why God gives us this, this promise that, you know what? Eventually, 
don't worry, vengeance is mine. Eventually, every knee will bow. We just fight where the truth lies. That's all we have to do in this Christian life. And look, our joy is this. Our joy is as we sometimes, maybe we lose here. Maybe we lose in the public's eye. Maybe we lose in the majority's eye. Maybe we lose here, but look, you know what we can do? We can look our families in the face. If we do what the Bible says, you know, we can, you know, we can stand up and we'll stand before Jesus one day and we'll say, you know what, we follow, we follow where the truth was. Where we found the truth, that's where we stood. Not every promise we will see fulfilled. And not everybody in the Bible saw that promise either. Great men in the Bible. But God still gives us this hope that we will win in the end and that every knee will bow. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.